So thanks again for coming. Really appreciate it. For those of you that uh, don't know me, my name is James Wilson. I own MTB Strength Training Systems. I started MTB Strength Training Systems in 2005 to help share some of the lessons that I had learned in my own journey about trying to learn how to apply good strength training principles to getting better as a biker. And so, uh, you know, since 2005, I've just continued to expand and refine my knowledge. And it's basically my passion in life is to help riders enjoy riding more. That's what it's all about. And so what I found is that strength training and some, some uh, exercises in particular are very effective for helping you do that. Now, at the heart of this, and this is something Christine and I were talking about uh, earlier, is kind of a mindset shift that you have to have, which is that you're not just doing an exercise, you're practicing a movement. And there is a way that you move on your bike that you can practice off of your bike that will help you move better on your bike. Does that make sense? So that's the basic idea behind what I call metabolic skills training, which is using your strength training and, and even like your cardio program in some respects to uh, also improve your skills on the bike. So you're not just getting stronger, you're improving how you move so that when you get on your bike, you can move better. And so if anybody's ever had a, uh, a skills class before or anything like that, you've probably encountered that moment where the instructor's telling you to do something and you're like, I just can't do that. Like I can't, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. I see you're saying butt back, chest down, or you're saying, you know, lean the bike over and get my hips over, or like whatever it may be, but you just can't do it. You know, you can try all you want. They can explain all they want. And what, what is, what that, what's happened is you've bumped up against your, your movement limits that you've, you've reached the end of your, your movement potential or, or real, you know, and so what you have to do is get off of the bike. You're not going to be able to learn how to move better on the bike. There's a lot going on, even in the parking lot, you know, you still are trying to balance, make sure that you're not running into stuff, you know, so you have to get away from that to be able to really focus on how you're moving to get better at it. And so that's the idea behind the metabolic skills training, get off the bike, to uh, improve that. And the next time you get on the bike and the instructor says butt back chest down, you're like, oh, that's like, you know, the deadlift. Oh, that's like the windmill or, the, you know, part of the get, the get up, which I'll show you tonight, that lateral hip hinge that you need for cornering, you know. So, um, so again, so that's the basic idea behind why this stuff is important. And so the Turkish get up, the exercise I'm going to show you guys tonight, the reason that I love it so much is because it's really kind of seven mini exercises in one. I'll, I'll show you the whole movement here in just a second. But each, each step is an exercise in itself that addresses a specific type of core strength or movement that a lot of them relate very directly to what we need as riders to help improve our body position, help improve cornering, help improve uh, standing pedaling power, uh, you know, things like that. A lot of things that, that, that most riders say like, hey man, I like to get better at that then the getup addresses that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the getup. I'm going to break down the different steps and explain exactly how they relate to riding so that you kind of buy into what's going on with it. And then, like I said, I'll give uh, you know, anybody that wants a chance to come out and, and try it um, a chance. And so um, before I show you the basic getup, I'm going to ask you a question. If I'm laying down on the ground like this, and I need to get up. I mean, is there a better way to get up? I mean, that doesn't look too crazy, right? That's a pretty, like, basic way to get up. That movement I just showed you right there is the Turkish get up. That's it. Okay? All it is is literally the most efficient, effective way to get off of your back up onto your feet, okay? And so, one of the guys that I uh, um, look up to in the strength training industry, Mike Boyle, he said he had this aha moment with the Turkish getup where he wasn't sold on the getup, but then he had this older client, <clears throat> excuse me, who was down on the ground and doing an exercise and it was time to get up and he, he literally had to help him up off the ground. He had lost the ability to get up off of his back onto his feet. And he realized that this is just a found, this is just an essential movement that we lose over time. 
you know, we lose stability in certain areas, we lose mobility in other areas, and the next thing you know, we've lost the basic mobility and stability we need to transition from lying to standing in an efficient and effective manner. So I, the reason I show you that is because the Turkish getup can be an intimidating exercise when you first see it. But when you put it in the context of like, I'm just getting up off of my back to standing up. I'm just doing it in a way that allows me to kind of get stronger with those foundational movements, then it puts it in a different light. Yeah, it's not quite as intimidating now. At least I don't think so. So, um, all right, so let me show you the Turkish get up. And I'll show you how it looks. I gotta move my, gotta be cognizant of your wireless mic when doing get ups, because if you roll the wrong way and you smash it, it's no good. All right, so this is the move. And it always starts with, oh, I got my white socks on tonight. I didn't know you guys get to see them. Um, we start with what's called a roll to press. And this is just a safe way to get the kettlebell into position. You know, so we'll go over that more. But even this movement right here has just some good kind of core strengthening, rolling, you know, basic rolling pattern. Like when you were a kid, what's the first thing you did? You learned how to roll over from your stomach to your back. So again, like some older adults have lost the ability to simply roll over, you know? So just some foundational core movements like this are just good to have, good in your routine. So you can roll over, get it up in a position. So we got a series of seven steps here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna get up on our elbow, we're gonna get up on our hand, we're gonna get the hips off of the ground, we're gonna pull the knee under us, at this point, we're going to do a little hip shift to the side to kind of get our weight off of our hand so that we can bring ourselves upright. And we windshield wiper around and we stand up. So that's it. And then we just do it in reverse. Big step back, windshield wiper around, hand out, extend the leg, drop the hips, and down. Like that. So again, if I'm on my back, I want to get up. That's it. It's what I just did. So there's some ways to modify the movement. I mean, obviously, I'm overemphasizing some aspects like the hip bridge. You know, if I'm just trying to get up off my back, I may not do that. I'll just pull my, my knee underneath me. But that, again, it's just the same basic movement, just emphasized a little bit. So. What I'll do is explain kind of what the different movements and how they help you as a rider. And then we'll uh, see if anybody wants to go through a few reps and, and, uh, and learn the movement. Sound good? Yeah? Okay. So the first movement, just getting up on your elbow and then uh, getting up on your hand, what I call the quarter get up. I mean, like a lot of things in, in strength and fitness, it just depends on who you read and what they call different stuff, which makes it so much more confusing for everyone. Um, so anyways, what I call the quarter get up, just get up to your elbow, up to your hand. That right there is just, it's just a really good basic core strengthening movement. You know, you can't, uh, you can't get up. I mean, you know, Nancy was finding out it's actually like one of the hardest parts to do. And so the reason is because you have to keep your core connected to get up off of the ground. So what, we, what a lot of people end up doing when they, when they do this exercise, they kind of roll up. And so they'll do something that looks like this. You know, they'll kind of like do this little like mini crunch and get up underneath it like that. So what we want to do though, is you want to get this nice and strong so that when you come up on your elbow, it's all coming up as a unit. You're driving with your lats, you're using your core, you're using your hip flexors to pull your, your, your core up as opposed to like just, you know, crunching up. And then same thing here when we drive our palm into the ground and we sit up, we just got ourselves in a nice tall sit position right here. So we're working on, on shoulder mobility and stability, which is another really good uh, thing that the get up gives us is because like, there's a difference between strength and mobility and stability. Like all those things are related, but they're not the same thing. So when people think like I need stronger shoulders, they think of stuff like shoulder presses and things like that to get them stronger. But really what we need, a lot of people, most people, 
need more mobility and stability in their shoulder joint first. You want to be able to do those presses and stuff. So the get up is good because you're not running movement through the shoulder joint. I'm not pressing the shoulder. So I'm not creating movement at the shoulder joint. I'm just stabilizing it. And then I'm just kind of like moving it a little bit, mobilizing a little bit. And so you end up taking the shoulder through a, a pretty big range of motion. And so you end up standing here. So there's people that can't press overhead without pain that can do a Turkish get up and end up in this position because they haven't pressed through the shoulder. So it's just a really good way to build that upper body stability. And so on the bike, how that translates for us is when you are, you know, when you're over in your attack position, the better you can keep, the stronger you can keep this, what I call the upper body core, the less you kind of let this collapse happen, the less you round the lower back, the stronger you keep this, the more stable your upper body is going to be on the trail. And so you're just going to find yourself not getting knocked around by the trail as much, not fatiguing as quickly uh, in the upper body, the shoulders and stuff. And so again, it's not a matter of strength as much as like stability throughout the shoulder joint. And so that the, the, the quarter get up is one of the best ways to work on that. How's it going? It's dark out there. Yes, it is dark. So, and you know what? I actually forgot to take this off before I started. So it's getting warmed up. Um, so anyways, so that's what the quarter get up works for. It's just some basic core strength, starts to develop that shoulder mobility and stability. And just getting strong on that will really help just kind of with the, with overall core strength and, and upper body stability. So the next move in the get up is this hip bridge action here. So we've gotten up to this point here. And so this move right here where we extend the hips, one of the things that you want to focus on with this, we're not pushing the hips up to the ceiling. What we're doing is we're, we're driving the shoulder and the knee away from each other. Okay. We want to extend the hips, which results in that. So we want it to look like this at the top. So like right here, I've got a nice, good, long line because I'm, I'm extending. That's where my focus is at. If I just push my hips up to the ceiling, I end up doing something that looks like that. Okay. So you want to focus on that extending of the hips and that helps us on the bike because one of the most important muscles on our, on our, in, in, on the body is the hips. Like that is the powerhouse of the, of the lower body right there. So, you know, people talk about the quads, the quads are the all show, no go muscle of the lower body. So how's it going? Good. Glad you could join us. Um, so we were just kind of breaking down the get up and just kind of some of the different uh, how, how some of the different moves relate to riding. And so uh, we've gotten to, to hip extension. So basically the ability to, to move from the hips, to flex at the hips, and then to drive forward from the hips is extremely important for us on our bikes because that is the key to good body position on the bike. One of the, the, the key to balance on your bike is the relationship between your center of gravity and your bike center of gravity. If those two things are lined up with each other, then you have traction, you have balance, everything's good. It's when those two things start getting out of whack that you lose balance and you fall over and, and bad things happen. So when you can learn how to move around the cockpit and power your movement with your hips, then you're operating from your center of gravity. So instead of like, so if you were, if you're going to lean over, instead of like leaning the shoulders over first and then kind of like pushing the butt back or, you know, what's uh, really common as well is raising the shoulders up first and kind of leading the movement with the shoulders. So if you go to pick the front end of your bike up and you lean back with the shoulders like that, I mean, one, we want a manual, which is like, you know, push the bike out in front and then it like results in the front end coming up. But you know, you'll hear some people like tell you like, you know, lean back real hard. It's not what you're wanting to do. You're wanting to extend the hips, which results in your shoulders leaning back. <clears throat> now, the reason this is important is because if you're, if you move from your shoulders, then you've changed your balance point in relation to the bike. And then your hips are trying to catch up to that. If you can learn how to move from your hips, then you're moving your center of gravity 
and everything else is, is moving around it. Does that make sense? So you're basically making sure that you're keeping your center of gravity and the bike center of gravity lined up as best as possible. So that's why moving from the hips is so important. And so, you know, also when you pedal, making sure that you're, you know, extending from the hips and not using a lot of like, you know, lower back to kind of like compensate. So if you don't have good hip extension, you're going to end up with a lot of low back uh, movement. And so again, just kind of off of the bike. Um, being able to move effectively that that really helps so um, so anyway so that's where we're at with the hip extension just kind of getting those hips up there and so again you know just coming up as high as you can as high as you need to this move right here when we get the leg underneath us what we're going to do is w this is called a windmill uh, the Turkish get up windmill there's another one where you're standing up on your feet but what's happening here I'm here, what I want to do is get my weight off of my hand because if I take my hand off the ground, I'm going to fall, right? And that just wouldn't look good. So what I want to do is I want to shift my weight off of my hand, but I'm going to do that by moving my center of gravity, right? We always want to move from here. So what we're going to do is I'm going to think about pulling my bottom rib to the top of my thigh. Okay, that action right there is going to get me to flex my hips and push them over. All right, so that right there is a lot different than just kind of like, you know, pushing over and you know, doing something like letting yourself round through here. Like you want to make sure that you're getting that hip flexion. I got my weight off of my hand and now I drive my hips back underneath me to bring me up. So again, I'm not, you know, leaning or, or with my shoulders. I'm not picking myself up from my shoulders. I'm driving my hips under. And that's what gets my hips to come under. And the same thing on the way down is I would pull those two points together and you can see my hips are leading the movement. I'm not leaning over, I'm driving my hips over and that brings my shoulders down. So this movement right here is the key to cornering. Who here's got cornering mastered? <laughs> we need to talk after class. I got some questions. Um, so anyways, so cornering is, you know, it's tough, man. It's tough to get down. And the reason is, is because it all hinges on that lateral hip hinge, that lateral hip movement. Now, you guys have probably heard, you know, like you want to twist your hips when you turn. Um, we're, we're not so much twisting the hips as what we're trying to do is, is uh, here's my, my big word for the day. We're going to displace our center of gravity in relation to the bike center of gravity. Okay, so what we're basically doing, we want to make sure that, so we're on our bike, we're gonna, we're gonna corner. We all know like leaning, leaning the bike over is the right way to corner, right? We don't turn the handlebars, we lean the bike over. We heard this before. All right, cool. If not, I got a video on my blog at bikejames.com, type in cornering, I go over some of this stuff. So you want to lean the bike over to get the, to, to corner, right? So when you lean the bike over, so right now my center of gravity and the bike center of gravity is lined up. I'm gonna push my bike center of gravity. When I lean my bike over, my bike center of gravity is gonna fall inside of me, okay? Now, if I just stay centered where I was, like, I've moved my bike center of gravity over. We, I'm gonna fall over, it's not gonna work. The only way that I can push my bike center of gravity this way is if I push my center of gravity the other way. And so the further and more effectively I can get my hips over this way, the further I can lean my bike over and maintain traction, okay? So again, it all comes down to that relationship between your center of gravity and the bike center of gravity. And so that lateral hip hinge and hip movement, being able to be on your bike and lean the bike over and be able to, you, I mean, you're twisting the hips, but again, like I can just twist my hips this way I didn't really displace my center of gravity, right? I twist my hips this way, and the action is exactly what I just did with the get up there. I'm pulling these two points closer together, and that results in the hips twisting, but it gets my hips out to the side. So that movement right there, I mean, if you did nothing else, if you remember nothing else from this clinic, and you didn't even do the Turkish get up, but you just worked that one movement right there, it will change 
your riding because it will, it will give you a movement skill that most riders simply lack, they don't have. And on a side tangent, this is one of the big differences between road riding and mountain biking, all right? Road riding, you do not need lateral hip mobility to, to corner like you do as a mountain biker. And in fact, the more you pedal, the stiffer your hips get. So it makes it harder for you to do this. So you run into this like, you know, problem. The more I do what I like, the more I pedal, the stiffer my hips get, the harder it makes for me to actually execute my skills. So that's why I like strength and mobility stuff has got to be part of your, your overall program along with riding. But, you know, um, just putting in miles on a road bike is not necessarily going to make you better on the trail because you're lacking, you know, the movement skills that you need. So you put those two things together, that's a different story. But, uh, but anyways, so lateral hip movement and strength. And so once we've done that, so we've gotten to this point here, right? I've gotten to this point. I just windshield wiper the leg around and now I stand up, okay? So that simple movement right there, that's standing pedaling, okay? One of the big differences between standing pedaling and seated pedaling, there's a couple there. I mean, the amount of tension in the core is different. Um, you know, how much the hips are working is, is different. There's, there's differences in, in the, in, in between the two movements, right? And so, one of the reasons that people think that standing pedaling is hard is because they've built a good fitness base with seated pedaling and then just kind of assume that, that standing pedaling is going to translate over. You know, like, you know, if I can sit and pedal for hours and hours, I should be able to stand up and pedal for like 30 seconds and not get winded, right? But we all know that's not always how it works out. So that's where um, increasing the core strength and the hip strength and the leg strength. So this move right here, as I'm here and I'm standing up, when I'm standing on my bike and I got to stand up to pedal, so I'm seated, I'm like here. The big difference is my hips are kind of behind my feet and so I'm kind of like pushing the, the pedals forward. When you stand up, you kind of got to get over the center of gravity more. You got to get over your pedals. You almost um, feel like, uh, you know, they're in front so you're able to actually like kind of drive the legs behind you. You don't want to stand up and kind of do like a standing version of seated pedaling, you actually have to change your posture, change your body position so that you can get your hips stacked on, or your shoulders stacked on top of your hips. You can get your hips into it more. You can take a lot of the stress off of the knees. So that right there is, um, that movement right there, the uh, standing, uh, standing up, last stand up position there, is kind of working that basic movement pattern of having that upright torso driving from the hips and really working that. And then that, that overhead thing, I mean, that just, you know, makes sure you're standing up. That's one of the cool things with the Turkish getup. It's what they call a self-limiting exercise. Like, if you can't do it, you can't do it. You know, like you'll hit a point in the getup where you can't, you try to go to the next move and it just doesn't work. Something collapses. And so it really prohibits you uh, keeps you from like almost doing too much, you know, like you, you hit a weight and it's like, man, I gotta, I can't do it. You can't, you can't like, you know, use a machine or throw on a weight belt or, you know, use some sort of like artificial means to work your way past the sticking point. Like you have to figure it out yourself. So, um, so that's basically it. So there we go. So with that one exercise, what did we cover? We covered just kind of upper body core strength and upper body stability. We've covered our, uh, our hip hinge, our ability to move from the hips and drive from the hips, which is gonna help us with our, uh, uh, really helps with, with manualing. Like once you get this action down here and you can like, you know, extend from the hips and push the bike forward, it totally changes um, that action there. So we've covered our cornering, we've covered our standing pedaling. Um, man, I mean, that's about it. I mean, any other skills you guys can think of that we've not, covered with that one exercise? No. What about doing that exercise with somebody who has bad knees? Well, <laughs> I mean, are you, are it, a lot of it depends on, uh, I mean, obviously you got any contraindications that say like, cause, cause again, like if I asked you to, if I asked you to lay on your back like, and I just had you, you know, get up on your elbow, and then get up on your hand. And then, you know, just somehow, like however works for you, all you need to do is just transition this knee under you, you know? 
So if you just pull, I mean, if that's it, you know, and then come up and, and stand up. So like, again, like that's a Turkish getup. Like I've had people, that's where we started. We, it, we did, it didn't even look like a Turkish getup. I'm literally just showing you how to kind of efficiently get up off of the floor. That's right, you missed the beginning. So you didn't see that demonstration. So I apologize. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. But you know what, I, I showed, I, I demonstrated that at the beginning because, you know, um, and actually your comment on Facebook about the bad knees was one of the reasons I wanted to demonstrate that and kind of put it in the right context of like, you know, this isn't an exercise, this is a basic movement that you should be able to do. And if you get it to the point where you can turn it into an exercise and add a kettlebell, great. But if not, if all you're doing is just kind of practicing that basic movement, just so you can maintain that, that basic human skill, you're still doing the exercise. But what you'll find is, is that you'll probably surprise yourself. And it's not as hard as it, as it looks. So, is it, Nancy? So, does that mean you do the opposite side? You would do the opposite side, yeah. You would do, yeah, yeah, you definitely. Great question. So, can you show us going the, on the opposite side? Um, sure, yeah. It looks the same. I just got to switch. Well, I mean, because most people get up like the same way all the time. Like, right. They always get up to the right side. Right, yep, yep. No, that's a good, that's a good point. So, and that's one of the great things about this, uh, this exercise too, is it is, um, you know, unilateral. So you do have to work each side separately. So you'll find that one side is weaker than the other. So, and then up, Boom. and then up. So, and you know what's funny? is I actually, like this is my preferred side, but because I've recognized that and I train myself so hard on my other side, I always start with my left side. It's funny, I just realized like I demonstrated it with my left side, you know? So, I, I mean, that is, that's my weaker side. So I have to make sure that I, um, you know, pay attention to that. But yeah, yeah, you do both sides. I mean. So just a couple um, suggestions with it, you know, programming wise, like when you, when you use this exercise, um, first thing to keep in mind, bad movement causes pain. So, you know, unless you have something where the doctor's like, you know, yeah, you know, this is, you got a blown disc or, you know, something's wrong with your knee or something like that. If it's just kind of like I move and it hurts, it's because you're moving wrong. And so you just need to kind of figure out how to move the right way. Like, so, Keep that in mind, it shouldn't hurt. Um, you know, you don't have to do the whole get up. Like I said, you can just start with getting up on your elbow and getting up on your hand. And in fact, when I, when I work with people, they spend the first month working with me and they don't do a Turkish get up. They just do, I have them do the key steps. The, key, the, the main steps that I have people work on are the quarter get up, which is the hand and the uh, um, getting up to the, uh, the, the elbow and the hand, the, uh, the hip drill, which is, this, this transfer right here, where you're getting the hips up and pulling the knee under you. So that one right there tends to give people um, problems. And the reason is because they're, they're just not strong. They don't know how to lift from the hip. And so they're trying to figure out how to power it from the knee and the lower back. So when this guy's not working, these two joints start taking over. So, um, so anyways. Actually, I'll show you a cool little drill that fixes that. So you go from here, back down to your elbow, and then do that hip drill just from here. And it really like, like takes out a lot of the, the potential compensation. Like you can't you know, do that, like get real crazy there. So, but anyway, so the, the hip drill right there, and then that, uh, that windmill. So just this action right here. So what I, usually what I do is just have people just work this movement right there and just kind of get that feel. So, you know, the quarter get up, the hip drill, and it's basically the whole get up except for the, the last part, the standing up. But when you work the different parts like that, instead of like just jumping in and doing the whole thing right off the bat, then it makes it a little easier to learn. Um, but you know, so when you are, so, you know, don't have to do it all. 
Um, and then it's not a high rep exercise. So you're not looking to do like three sets of 10 with this thing. You're looking to do like maybe, you know, five to six reps total between both sides. So I, I suggest starting out with just singles on each side. You don't even want to do multiple reps. So just one, one on each side, like, so like three to six times alternating sides, um, you know, eventually building up to where you can do two or three in a row. You know, I don't, there's really no reason to go much beyond three, but um, you know, and then at that point you can get strong with it. So, and uh, then, you know, there's some other interesting variations, you know, with like presses and stuff in there. So there's, a, I mean, that one exercise right there, like I said, I mean, you've got seven individual exercises, you got one full exercise, you can do one rep, you can do multiple reps, you can, you know, add in presses at various steps. So, I mean, you got a whole lot with just that one, one thing right there. So, um, and like I said, rep for rep, you're getting more out of that than just about anything else. So I will also real quickly say that while you can do this with a dumbbell, I find that the, the kettlebells um, just, they work better. They, they, they force you to be more aware of the balance point. The fact the kettlebell is not balanced in your hand and it's kind of offset one, it kind of pulls the arm back a little bit and forces these muscles on the backside that usually don't get used a lot to turn on. Um, and it uh, just kind of makes you have to balance it a little bit more. And then also, the wrist position that you have is real similar to what you need on the bike. Okay, so like rep for rep, every rep you do while holding a kettlebell here is also building the wrist stability that you need to have a good, you know, upper body cockpit position. So, which, in case, you know, so what we're looking for there, that we don't need the wrist perfectly straight. We need a little bit, you know, a little bit of a, a cock to the wrist, but not more than that. And we need that to stay strong, you know, so we don't want to be letting the wrist bend excessively and leaning into it. If we can keep it like that, then the force is going through the bones. It's not going through the tendons and the ligaments and all the sensitive stuff right here. So, uh, so again, you know, as riders, like that grip strength and wrist strength is just so important. So, um, yeah, so that's why I like kettlebells better than dumbbells. It's called synergistic dominance. And basically, you're, you have two muscles here. You've got your, you know, your, your glutes and, you know, there's a bunch of muscles there, but your glutes and your hamstrings work together to extend the hips, or at least they're supposed to. So what happens, though, is we end up getting glute amnesia, and we literally, like the body forgets how to really forcefully contract the glutes. And so the hamstrings start taking over uh, a lot of the hip extension. And so when you're, when you're doing that hip extension, especially if you're focusing on what I told you to with like, you know, spreading the shoulders and knees versus just pushing the hips up, then your body's like trying to figure out how to extend the hips and the glutes aren't coming online. And so you get this hamstring, what feels like kind of like a hamstring pull or tightness because the, the hamstring's kind of taken over the, the thing. So for you, that elbow bridge that I had, uh, had, had showed you guys. So if you just came up to your elbow, and so instead of coming up to your hand and doing this, you stay down on your elbow and just really focused on this shortened range of motion, that whole just extension. And, and when you drop back down again, that, that idea of like trying to pull your bottom rib and the top of the thigh together to make sure that you're, you're flexing at the hip, you're not like, you know, collapsing at the lumbar spine or something like that. But that drill right there will really help kind of get the hips back working on an online. So, and that's another, you know, if you don't have those hips working right and you go up to stand a pedal, I mean, it's just hard, you know, you just can't get the, the hips into it as much. And so, um, so yeah, and that, that will help your endurance too. Like one of the things I'll, I'll, I'll kind of end with to put it all in perspective too, is that lack of, of uh, fitness in one area can mask fitness in another area. And so if you have some weaknesses, if you aren't using your hips as effectively as you could, 
if you have some core strength issues, if you have some asymmetries, you know, where you're stronger on one leg than the other, you know, those things right there will make pedaling your bike harder than it has to be. And so you can be fit from just a cardiovascular standpoint, but really overly fatiguing yourself when you're asking your body to do some of these movements and efforts that it's not efficient with. So kind of the paradox of mountain biking is there's things that we need on the trail that we don't do enough on the trail to significantly improve, you know? So that's where the training comes in. So like that, you know, real hard, techy, grindy climb. I mean, you know, how many, I mean, honestly, how many times a ride do you do that? I mean, how much total time do you spend doing that? And that's one of the reasons that like beginners, first time they go out, you know, riding access fitness, but then you plateau because your body's gotten used to it. But anyways, the point is, is that, you know, those, those efforts like that, the standing sprints, you know, the sprint climbs, the rough technical descents, the things like that, after a while, you just don't do it enough on the trail to get fitter at it, you know? So that's why where the training comes in. So, and then it will help your endurance as well. Cause if you move more efficiently, it's like increasing the gas mileage in your car, right? Everybody wants to put a bigger engine. Everybody wants bigger muscles, bigger VO2 max. I'm like, man, make sure you got the parking brake off first, you know? So if your hips are tight and not working right, then you're cruising around with your parking brake on for all intents and purposes. So, um, so yeah, but yeah, that would kind of help with, with that. So yeah, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. So when you so so when you're driving from the elbow up to the hand. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, I'll show you guys a few little pointers on that. So you're down on your we're down on our elbow. So the first thing that you want to do is remember that your position sets up your next movement. And so if you are kind of sitting here and you're kind of chilling here like this, you know, and the shoulders disengaged, it's out away from the, you know, we don't have this upper body core position nice and strong. And then you go to move, it's just not going to work, right? So you want to make sure before you do it, you get that, that arm, that, uh, you know, the lat nice and tight, you get that shoulder, they, they call it packing the shoulders. And, and in a nutshell, your shoulders, they're the most mobile joint in the body, right? But the trade-off is that they have a very small position where they're stable enough to really safely handle load and they get pulled out of that position very easily. And so we got to really make sure that we're keeping those shoulders as part of the torso. It's when the shoulders kind of start wandering away from the torso and doing their own thing that problems pop up. So that right there, just being really conscious of that. So that, and that's kind of where that, that, you know, um, that drill I did with you, it was on the other side, you know, not on the arm on that side, but, but that basic idea of like sucking the shoulders into the torso and getting them nice and strong. And then when you come up on your, on your hand, I mean, one, you'll probably feel stronger already, but you want to, there's a spot right here on your palm. It's got a bundle of nerves that help activate the tricep. Then, and the, the long head of the tricep actually uh, runs through the shoulder joint as well. And so if you don't have good, strong like tricep contraction and lockout, then the shoulder joint won't be as stable as it can be. And so what you wanna do is focus on, on driving. You're gonna actually kind of rotate the palm a little bit because you gotta, you gotta get the hand behind you. If you just try to come up here, your shoulders kind of jammed up right here. You got to open it up. What you don't want to do is just pick the hand up and put it behind you because that will mess up your spacing. So what you want to do is drive that point into the ground and you pivot on it so that at that top position, I'm really driving that thing hard into the ground. My fingers are back behind me. My triceps locked out nice and tight. I'm sitting up nice and tall. And again, just focusing on that shoulder being packed in. So that'll help. You wanna try it? Sure. Yeah, cool. Oh man, my tricep just cramped doing that. <laughs> cool. So you just wanna make sure, as a general rule, so here's your hips, right? So if I drew a line straight down, 
You want your heel outside okay. of that line right there. Cool. I'll just have this down just a little bit. Okay. All right, so get that shoulder packed into the body before you even start. Nice, good. Okay, up on your elbow. Okay, all the way up. Yeah, there you go. Good, now before you move again, just wanna make sure you got the, don't move so much. No, you're good. I just wanna okay. make sure you're nice and strong. So kind of pinch your shoulder blades back. There, there you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. How's that feel? Uh, it feels okay. It still feels just like a little bit disconnected somewhere. Okay. Somehow. So, here, get your lat, like right here. Mm -hmm. I'm like kind of cramp your armpit. There you go. Okay. There you go, right there. So now we're ready to rock. So now, that point, you're gonna press that point down and rotate your, your fingers back behind you as you come up. So it all kind of happens at once. And lift. Yep, good. Good, now press that point in to the ground. There you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Flex that tricep hard, got that tight. Good, how's that feel? That feels good. Okay, good. And then now, so keeping this nice and tight, come back down to your elbow. There you go, good. Keeping this nice and tight, Come back down to your back. There you go. Nice. How'd that feel? That was good. Better? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't, and here's the thing, and here's the other uh, thing. You, good movement feels a certain way. Focus on the feeling, okay? Don't act a Turkish getup out. Feel a good Turkish getup, and it will look good, you know? So, if you're, you can do a Turkish getup, and if you're not, you know, if, if we hadn't gotten that, you know, nice and tight and strong, you know, gotten that dialed in, you know, if you weren't aware of like kind of the, 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 you know, getting the hips doing it, you know, you can get through a Turkish getup and miss what we want out of it, you know. So focus on the feeling, and it will always look right. You can make it look right and totally miss out on what we're trying to feel. And so it also makes it so much easier to learn. Because right now you guys are sitting here like, holy crap, there's so much to remember. And there is. I've thrown a lot at you guys. It's taken me years to like get to this point with the Turkish getup. But, you know, the, the, the basic idea is just focus on a few feelings, you know. You want to be, that shoulder packing thing is so important. That, that's where so many people lose the Turkish getup is they've got lazy shoulders and lazy upper bodies. So if you keep that nice and packed and tight, I mean, that right there will do a ton for you. And, uh, you know, over time, it's just kind of, there's a, uh, a book that I've, uh, I talk about on my blog um, called The Book of Five Rings by Mayamatu Musashi. You might have read it before. No? Yeah, I did. did you? It's an awesome book. It's great. It's, uh, I, I mean, quick synopsis. Uh, Musashi was a, a samurai in the um, early 1600s. He's the greatest swordsman Japan's ever had. He's you know, very famous over there, undefeated in over 60 like, you know, duels to the death. You know? And so one day he realized he was either the luckiest guy on earth or there's something about the way that he approached training that made him better and different. And so he retreated to the mountains and meditated on it. And, and the Book of Five Rings is his kind of uh, treatise on his, on his way of training. And so even though it's about sword fighting, it's not about sword fighting. It's about the pursuit of a way and the mindset it takes to pursue mastery with something. And so uh, one of the great quotes in the book is that words can lead you to the start of the path. They can't walk you down the path. So at a certain point, your training becomes more about your internalized study of yourself and your own pursuit of perfection with your own movement, having standards, understanding what, standard, what standards you need to have and then pursuing them, like that, at a certain point, that's the essence of it, you know? And so I run into this issue with clients from time to time, like, man, I'm doing everything that you say. And I'm like, yeah, but you're not really like, you're just doing what I'm saying. You're not feeling what I'm telling you to feel, you know? And so, um, so anyway, so there's your, your Yoda Zen-like proverb <laughs> to end the, end the class. But the Turkish getup really honestly, it sums that statement up better than any exercise I've ever come across because you just have to dive into it. You, you just have to be all right with sucking at it and then you can kind of all right at it and that's kind of, you know, where I'm at and, uh, you know, and eventually it's just a great exercise you do. So, yeah. So now I'm here to go try to 
how to do it. You, you said you'd recommend doing it two to three times every week, a day. You know, if you're trying to learn the Turkish getup, I would recommend doing it every day. You know, it's like learning math, you know. Are you going to learn math if you only, learn, you know, go once a week? You know, they teach you math every day when you're st first learning it. You know, eventually you get to the point where you only need to take a math class once or twice a week. You know, and so that's the same thing with some, anything you're trying to learn. And again, that's the difference between an exercise and a movement. So I would recommend doing the Turkish getup. And again, you're not, it's not, an, it's not, you're not doing it as a workout. You're practicing your movement and you get a workout as a result of that practice. So you're not trying to smash yourself with the Turkish getup. You're trying to practice your movement. So if you did, you know, three reps on each side every day for a couple weeks, you'd come out of it. I mean, what, that'd be freaking over 40 some odd reps per side, you know, by the end of two weeks, just spending five minutes on it a day. You, ha you would have the Turkish getup down pretty good by that point, you know, you would have a, you, you know it very well. So um, if you're using it as an exercise, I mean, I, I like to do it. There's this famous saying by Dan Gable, he's a, a Olympic wrestler guy. Um, if it's important, do it every day. If it's not important, don't do it at all, you know? And it's, <laughs> it's a good way to live your life, but it's especially a good way to look at your training program. Like if it's important to do, do it every day. And, and, that's, and this is just, you know, where variety starts to get to be a problem because people are always pursuing variety instead of mastery. And mastery is where you get results. Variety is just where you like keep yourself entertained. So, um, so yeah, and that's why, you know, when I was thinking about what to do for this clinic, I was like, what, what can I, what can I give you ladies? It's honestly a, something you can take and actually use, you know, instead of a lot of theory on, you know, training loads and blah, blah, periodization and, and stuff like that for off season training. If you did nothing but focus on the Turkish getup and you came out of this off season, able to do a Turkish getup on each side with 25 to 35 pounds and it doesn't feel like, holy crap, that's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. It's like, yeah, that's good. You know, that's kind of tough, but I'm pretty, I'm solid with that. I mean, it would have a major impact on your riding. It would be huge. You would feel it in so many areas on your bike. And so, um, so yeah, so no matter what you're doing for your off season training, you know, you should plug this in to, to it. And so whether it's practicing it every day or whether you're doing it, you know, at the beginning of your workout as kind of your core training or something like that, you know, you can plug this exercise in just about any routine and, uh, or you can just focus on it and get strong as crap on it. So, I mean, I've had two, I've had a grade two AC separation on this shoulder, a grade one on this one. I've got a torn meniscus in my left knee. I mean, I've, you know, I've had some pretty good injuries. And uh, the Turkish get-ups kept me put together. So I don't have any shoulder problems. I don't have any knee problems. I don't have any issues with those areas. And uh, I can say with confidence, Turkish get-ups been number one reason. I did one with 106 pounds the other day, man. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I was surprised. So it, ha, uh, <laughs> I didn't know they made a kettlebell that big. Um, yeah, it's 48 kilos. I call it the beast. But I uh, only did it on my right side. I couldn't do it on my left because, you know, my left's my weaker side, but that's all right. Um, so anyways, so yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, does that kind of answer your, your question? It's, yeah, it's about easy strength, you know. You want to work on it and, and get your reps in and, and you'll get stronger at it just from practicing it. You don't have to like, it's not an err exercise. That's why I like it, you know. You can't err your way through it can't freaking slap on Metallica and a weight belt and <laughs> go crank through it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've got uh, a couple um, resources. I mean, I've got, I got a bunch of videos on my blog uh, at bikejames.com. If you type in Turkish get up, I mean, you'll, I've got a, you know, a love affair with the exercise. You'll find out very quickly. Um, so I've, I've got a couple of, uh, videos there that go into the Turkish getup in more detail. Um, and so, uh, I've also got a kettlebell program. I actually just came out with an updated version of it. Um, the MTB kettlebell conditioning program, it's only 37 bucks and it's a, you know, 12 week program. It has an intro phase too. So there's kind of like a, 
you know, four week intro phase. If you don't have a lot of strength training or kettlebell training experience, and then a, a 12 week program that really just, by the time you're done with it, you're going to be freaking rocking on your swings and your get ups and your, your basic core kettlebell exercises. And, and so, uh, um, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, Um, you know, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's, I, I, I don't do personal training out of the facility anymore. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just like coaching wise, I mean, I do, I do like, you know, uh, consultations. Like if I charge 175, um, for a, uh, for a one hour consultation with a, uh, with a program based on that consultation. And, and with that, I take you through the functional movement screen, which is my way of like being able to pinpoint any movement dysfunctions with a little more accuracy so we can address them. Cause you're only strong as your weakest link, you know? And so if you have a weak link in your basic fundamental movements, then you're going to have problems. Cause all there's only, you know, like seven, like depending on who you talk to you, basically all the complex stuff that we do up here is built on this basic stuff down here. And so if any of this basic stuff is off, like if your hips aren't working right, or your lats aren't getting the shoulders sucked in right, or something like that, then everything else that you're doing tends to get compensated. So uh, the functional movement screen, and then uh, take you through some good um, coaching. I mean, you know, Nancy went through it uh, yesterday, and I mean, it's just basically what we what we did today, but personally personalized to you and what you're doing. You know, so it's not just here's the exercise and do it. It's like you know, here's the exercise and here's how you need to get the most out of it. And so, and then getting you a program, you know, based on those recommendations. So, um, but yeah, that's like kind of the, the easiest thing. I've got a more in depth thing. It's 300 bucks a month and I require you to commit to four months of training, but you know, that's a monthly session and a weekly check in. And it's basically me handling a hundred percent of your training. So, um, you know, to be honest with you, the, 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 the best value, the best thing are my programs that I have online. And